This is Kushinara in northern India. After wandering around northern India for 45 years, teaching the Dharma, the Buddha made his final journey to this spot. He was now 80 years old and very tired. This old body is like a rickety cart held together with string, the Buddha said to Ananda, his faithful friend and companion. Like all things, it is impermanent. Knowing his life was reaching its end, and despite being in constant pain, the Buddha set off on a final round of visits to places where he could offer some last words of advice and encouragement. Eventually they reached the little town of Kushinara. At that time a stone seat lay here for the town's elders to rest in the cool shade of the sal trees. On this couch, the Buddha lay down on his right side. His followers gathered around and he gave instructions for his funeral arrangements. But this was too much for Ananda to bear. He went away to a nearby hut and leaned against the door, weeping. I am still only a beginner. My teacher, who is so kind, is about to leave us. One of his friends went over to him. Ananda, the teacher calls you. When Ananda returned, the Buddha greeted him with a smile. Do not cry, Ananda. Have I not often told you that we all have to part with our loved ones? You have always been kind to me and have looked after me for all these years. Your efforts will bear fruit. Maintain your practice and you too will gain enlightenment. The Buddha then looked around at the gathering of his followers. Are there any questions about the Dharma? Is there anything that anyone would still like to ask? The followers were silent. If you feel unsure, tell your question to a friend. Still there was silence. Everybody was clear about the Dharma. And so the Buddha uttered his final words. All things are impermanent. With mindfulness strive on. Then he entered into meditation and passed away. At that moment the sal trees suddenly burst into white blossom and showered their large petals over him. Many of his followers were in tears, but those closest to him remained perfectly calm because they knew that the end of the Buddha's life is not death in the ordinary sense at all. His passing away is known as the Parinirvana, which means Supreme Nirvana. Not long after, a great meeting was called. The main followers of the Buddha met for the first great council near one of the Buddha's favorite places in Rajgir. They each recited all the Buddha's teachings that they had memorized. They wanted to preserve the Buddha's teachings accurately so that they could be learnt and passed on to as many people as possible. On every full moon night, groups of his followers would gather together to chant the teachings. Many years later, when writing was introduced, the teachings were written down and now vast collections of the Buddha's teachings can be found in many languages. It was not just what the Buddha taught that was important. The way he and his followers put the teachings into practice in their lives provided a model and inspiration for future members of the Sangha. So, not surprisingly, others too began to develop qualities of wisdom, compassion, generosity, fearlessness and tireless energy. As a result, the Sangha began to grow and grow, and the followers of the Dharma, as they called themselves, became established in every corner of India. Buddhists believe that anybody can practice the Dharma and that anybody can gain enlightenment. Lifestyle is not as important as a commitment to practicing with all one's heart. Some ways of life make it easier to practice than others. In the early Sangha, we can see three main lifestyles. First of all, there was the forest dweller. He or she lived like the Buddha, having no home, few possessions, and spending most of their time meditating and talking about the Dharma. Then there were the monks and nuns who lived in settlements, often on the edges of villages. They were especially important for writing down the Dharma and teaching others. Thirdly, 
There were the lay followers or householders. They were followers who had worldly responsibilities but still wanted to practice the Buddha's teachings. Having money and families, they were especially able to practice generosity and kindness by providing food for the monks, nuns and forest dwellers. All could practice the Dharma following whatever lifestyle that seemed best. All could gain enlightenment and there are countless stories in Buddhist texts of men and women who did. The Sangha spread and spread until, at one time, a third of the population of the world was Buddhist. 